Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to be here, and I want to thank the uh, Nell and the other organizers for uh, this uh, very nice meeting. I have to say, I really like this format of having a session only in the afternoon because we can uh, really uh, work and uh, do some great science, and it's really uh, cool this way. I hope there will be other conferences like that. So today I'm not really uh, going to talk about what I usually talk, but rather about a um, perspective review paper that we wrote last year uh, for a special um, edition of the Journal of Molecular Biology, which was edited by Roman Kozul and Marcelo Nolman and which was called Perspectives on Chromosome Folding. And um, this review was written with Melody Mel, which was a PhD uh, in my group at the time, and Annie Clay, a colleague from the Theoretical Physics for Condensed Matter Lab. So the title of this review is The 3D Genome Shapes the Re Regulatory Code for Developmental Genes. And I have to say this, uh, may sound very fancy, but this is also kind of uh, vague and abstract because it's not really clear what is the 3D genome, what means shape, and what's uh, the regulatory code for developmental gene regulation. So I'm going to um, be more precise and uh, summarize my talk in one sentence, which is the gene domain is the adapter of the gene regulation code, which may seem also a bit uh, abstract, but it's quite precise. And I'm going to define every uh, single word uh, in this sentence. And by the, the half of the talk, you should exactly uh, understand what I mean by this. So I'm going to start with the word code, which is uh, very often uh, used uh, in biology but it's not very often um, defined. So if we go to the uh, Cambridge Dictionary and look for the word code, here are three definitions what, uh, what we can get. The first is a system of letters or signs used to represent a message in a secret or more convenient form. So this is basically a secret code. The second is a set of principles that are accepted and used by society or a particular group of people, like a moral code. And the third one, uh, a language used to give instructions to computer. So um, it's not really clear when people use the word code, even in biology, what sense um, they refer to. For sure, it's not the second one, but sometimes, it's the first one, so the, the secret code or a semantic code. And sometimes uh, it's also the third one because they would take the metaphor of computers applied to biological systems. So in this talk, um, I will take the, the first definition and give the start with the most emblematic example, the genetic code. So the gen genetic code that you all know associates three uh, nucleotides with one amino acid. So it's exactly as a secret code. And this table here is the key of the code that will allow you to know what is the protein sequence from the DNA sequence. So the physical basis of this code is, as you know, the tRNA, this molecule here, that on one end is able to recognize the codon, and on the other end is linked to the corresponding amino acids. So the set of these tRNAs in the cell, that's the physical basis for this uh, table that you have here. This was um, uh, anticipated by Francis Crick before uh, we even know that RNA was the mediating uh, molecule. And uh, he, in, in a paper where he described this code, he uh, proposed three important ingredients to really define a code. The first ingredient is the code word. So what, uh, what is the, the the object, how is the object encoded? What are the code words? The second is the adapter that links the code word with the object. So here with the corresponding color, you see that the adapter has an important role in defining the code and has three important parts. One which connects to the code word, one which connects to the object, and very importantly, a part which connects the two. What about the gene regulation code? You may have 
heard about the gene regression code, but what are the code words, the adapters, and the object of this code? So I'm going to start with a very um, idealized word where um, it's a binary world, where transcription factors are named by letters, and they can be either present, one, or absent in the cell. So you have here a kind of barcode, which will give you the, the full set of transcription factor in your cell. And this will be my uh, code words. And what is my object? My object is gene expression. So for instance, if I take the gen X as an example, this gene, given this set of gene uh, transcription factor present or absent, can be either expressed or repressed. So the next question is, what is the adapter of this code? So we have seen uh, in the past days, and you maybe know uh, for a long time, that the adapter for this code is in fact the uh, piece of chromosome itself, which will link the enhancer, which can recognize the transcription factor, to the promoter, which uh, is the, 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 the sit sitting place for the potentially active polymerase. So giving, uh, digging a bit further into this ID, uh, we can see the, uh, the different keys of the gene regulation code at the truth table. As you know, some transcription factor, they can activate genes. So for instance, here, the star-shaped transcription factor would be activating. Some others, they would be inhibiting. So uh, this enhancer here uh, can work at the truth table. So that if the inhibiting factor here, the round, is present, the output is null. There is no transcription. On the other hand, if the star transcription factor here is absent, there is no transcription. There is only transcription in the case where you have the star transcription factor and you don't have the round transcription factor. So this is a typical truth table. And now come the, the 3D picture, uh, 3D genome into the picture, and I will define the gene domain, the third ingredient of the sentence. So the gene domain will be the piece of chromosome which is found in between two insulating sequences and that will contain the gene of interest. So the great thing about this domain is that it can integrate the inputs for, from several insulators and not insulators which are outside of the domain. So um, continuing the example uh, I was giving you with one, uh, this in truth table that we had in the previous slide. Now we can add a second truth table coming from this enhancer that would be the exact opposite. So the activating transcription factor is now the round and the inhibiting is now the star. And the genome, what the genome does is that it sum up all these uh, inputs and give us a new truth table so that the gene uh, X here will be active only if there is one and only one of the transcription factors. So uh, I apologize, but uh, just so that you don't get too disappointed uh, by the rest of the talk, this is the only and, pro and the highest uh, re resolution high C map that you would see uh, on this talk. So now if we quit the uh, ideal binary word uh, that uh, I described, um, we can introduce another important notion, which is the gene expression diagram. And so now it's exactly the same truth table, but I plotted it as a, a function of the continuous concentration of the two transcription factor, the round and the star. And the color code here gives us the activity of the gene of interest, so that the gene is expressed only in this region where I have only the star uh, transcription factor, or this region where I have only the RAM, but not in this region where I have both transcription factors. So now, just to um, really settle things for everyone, I will take a metaphor for this code, which is a safe metaphor. So let's say that each gene is a safe and the sequence of the protein that it encodes is hold safe inside it. 
the uh, combination of this safe will correspond to the um, amount of transcription factors that are present in the cell, in the nucleus, and each gene has only a set of combination that opens it, and for the rest of the combination, it will be shut down. Now, if we push a bit further this metaphor, we can say that the genome is the safe roof of a bank, and that um, uh, Mr. Lever, uh, for instance, comes into uh, this uh, room, and Mr. Lever only knows one combination, the combination corresponding to the transcription factors which are found in the liver. And he will set all the uh, safe combination to the specific combination, and some of them will open, and these will be the genes which will be expressed in the liver. So now, as I told you uh, at the, the, the middle of this talk, I think it should be quite clear what I mean by this sentence, the gene domain is the adapter of the gene regulation code. Now, what see, uh, let's see where it uh, brings us um, to understand better what happened during development. So I'm gonna take now a real case example uh, that you know already pretty well because uh, you have seen Marcelo's and Juanma uh, talk uh, yesterday and two days ago. And I'm going to focus on this very specific stage of uh, an early stage of uh, Drosophila development, where you have a synthesium of uh, 6,000 nuclei that will start uh, zygotic gene uh, expressions. So these gradients here are uh, maternal uh, RNAs which have been deposited in the egg and they already established the, the preliminary map uh, of the embryo. So when um, a zygotic expression is uh, triggered, some genes will respond to these uh, gradients of uh, molecules and will be expressed in specific parts of the embryo. The first of them are the gap genes and later on the parallel genes and so on and so forth by uh, cascade of regulation, you will end up with uh, fi finer and more defined patterns of gene expression, which will ultimately define uh, the body map of the, of the Drosophila. So these, um, these, um, the expression of uh, these genes has been measured quite, uh, quite a time ago in 2008 using uh, RNA fish in a, very big effort from um, Berkeley Group, which has published a quantitative spatial temporal uh, atlas of gene expression in the Drosophila blastoderm. So what uh, you, I show you here is the um, quantification of uh, 80 different transcription factors um, that are found at this stage, and which tells us in every single uh, nuclei of the 6,000 nuclei, what is expressed uh, along four time points uh, of development. What we did is that we used this uh, data and we focused on um, one uh, of this step, which is the, the regulation of the expression of one pair rule gene uh, from the gap genes. So the, the gap gene the parallel genes that we will focus is uh, Eve, which is uh, very uh, well studied in the literature. And the four gap genes that regulates Eve are called Krüppel, Hunchback, Giant, and Knirps. So this is the pattern of expression of each of these genes. So we have the uh, RNA compound of uh, each of these genes in each nuclei of the embryo. And this is the pattern of expression of Eve. And from this, so the pattern of expression is composed of seven stripes. And from these uh, expression here, we can define here for each stripe a code word that is the, um, the expression, the, the quantity of transcription factor that activates Eve in each of these stripes. Of course, um, these are important, but equally important here, but not represented are the code words that shut down the expression of Eve be, uh, between each of uh, these stripes. So to get a more uh, global view of uh, this um, 
regulation code of Eve, we ask the question, can we build the gene expression uh, diagram for Eve? This is what we did here by using um, a 2D representation of the four dimensional uh, space that constitute the transcription factor concentration. So in our case, we have uh, four transcription factors. So on this plot here, um, I plot uh, every uh, dot corresponds to one uh, nuclei, which is found in the embryo. So here, one nuclei from stripe one, here is one nuclei from stripe two, and so on and so forth. And, and each um, nuclei here is represented, uh, the position of each nuclei is represented uh, corresponding to the quantity of transcription factors that is found in this nuclei. So here I represented axis, uh, the point which would be here, would have only uh, CNI and not uh, the other uh, transcription factor. And here we have only Kruppel and so on and so forth. And what you can see is that there are patches in this uh, gene expression diagram of activation, that is combinations of these uh, transcription factor for which the gene Eve is acti active and other uh, regions for which the gene is uh, inactive. So why does it matter? I think it's very important to define properly the words we use. And code is typically an example of a word that, it, that is often used with all the variants such as encode, decode, and so on and so forth. But um, people don't really um, think always what, uh, what, what is a code. And when you now uh, read or use this word, I would like to think of the following question. What is the code word? What are the objects? And most especially, what is the adapter of the code I'm referring to? Now, the gene expression diagram, I think it matters because it replaces the gene network concept. So gene networks, is what you see here, is uh, uh, um, nodes are usually transcription factors. Uh, or genes, and the, the arrows um, in between, the links between these nodes, they are uh, activation or inhibition of genes by other genes. If I take this very simple example of gene diagram, the fact is I cannot put it in the form of a gene network because the same factor can be at the same time activating or inhibiting. So I think that in most complicated case of a developmental, we should just get rid, get rid of this idea of gene network, which is not able to convey the complexity of the system. But we should rather switch to this uh, gene expression diagram. I showed you with uh, some uh, RNA fish data that we can um, uh, use this idea in real life, and we can um, um, measure and visualize this gene diagram. And this will become especially more important with the surge of single uh, cell RNA sequencing, which now allows us to measure the activity of genes, uh, single cells across development. Finally, I think it's, it matters because it partially solves um, some of the controversy which have, have been put forward, especially by uh, Luca uh, yesterday. When you, you, you look at the importance of that disruption uh, on gene expression, you end up with different um, results. Where, whereas you, where if you look um, in a system that is uh, regulated during development, so for instance, um, you all know this uh, emblematic example of uh, the number of fingers we can, which can change by allowing uh, an answer to be regulated by um, uh, promote a gene to be regulated by an answer which don't belongs to its stats. Whereas if you have, if you are in a cell culture where you have only one code word and you disturb the boundaries, then you might not end up with big uh, chance, with big changes. So I don't think, in fact, there is a, really a paradox here on the the effect of gene borders. It's just that they are uh, looked at in a very different context, and context matters a lot. 
Finally, I would like uh, to thank uh, the many uh, groups uh, without uh, which work it would not be possible to, to come up with these ideas. Um, these ideas, um, they are not mine, they are um, shared by a lot of person, but um, I would like to expose it in a slightly different way uh, today because it's not always um, done in so precise manner and I think it's very important to do that. So these are uh, many of the experimental works that led to these ideas. So this is the, the review um, from which you can find all these citations put into context and justifications of the model I, I just proposed you. So we have called these uh, domains gene domains, but in another review, which basically um, um, highlights a similar concept, uh, Stefan Munlos and Daniel Ibrahim called them regulatory chromatin domains, and you can find also some other names for this uh, adapter of the gene regulation code. With that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Julia, for this presentation. So we'll start by a question uh, from Marcelo. Uh, if you want to just ask it uh, directly. Okay, so um, first, thanks, Julian, for this very enlightening uh, lecture. Uh, I understood much better your paper. So another question regarding the presence of two activating transcription factors leading to the repression of a gene. This is because the simultaneous presence leads to the expression of yet another factor that will probably be a repressor that binds to the enhancers and then leads to the repression of the gene? So um, in the, the simple scheme uh, which I described uh, here, one is an activator and one is a repressor. Um, so what, what can be here uh, puzzling is that uh, here for this other enhancer, it's just the other way around. So the, 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 the factor which was activating for this enhancer is now repressing for this enhancer. And uh, uh, the factor which was repressing for this enhancer is now activating for this enhancer. So this may seem um, um, quite uh, strange, but actually that's uh, what we see uh, here. When you look at the exp expression of, uh, of Eve, um, if you, uh, you agree with the fact that these are the only genes which will regulate Eve, of course, that's an important uh, hypothesis. It's not me who is doing it, but uh, other leaders in, in the field. But if you assume that, then you have to, to come up with the conclusion that uh, sometimes, uh, every of these four transcription factor will be activating for some of the stripes, but in other stripes, they will be uh, repressing. So depending on the enhancer they work on, they will have this uh, dual role. Does this answer your question? Yes, partially. So do you think that this is because when they're combined, they lead to the expression of a repressor that will bind to this enhancer? And so will it mean that this enhancer now becomes a repressive element? I, I, I think we, we are not uh, there yet. We, we don't know how, how this, uh, this uh, work. Uh, and um, I, I know that some groups are trying to answer this question by making um, synthetic enhancers and trying really to uh, modulate the, the binding sites for the, the different the transcription factors to try to understand uh, how uh, you can have a repressive effect with uh, a factor which is otherwise activating. So we have a, a question on how universal would um, such a regulatory code uh, be? Uh, would it apply, would the same code apply to whole tissue and to different tissues? Um, or are you envisioning something very specific? Of course, you can always fall back on your, on your foot if you say that the gene network depends on the concentration of factors which are present so that um, the action of a gene A on gene B 
will depend on the fact that G that gene C is, uh, gene or let's say transcription factor C is uh, is present or not. But then for me there is no uh, there there is no gain of having this idea of a network. Th this is exactly the 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 gene expression diagram that I show, but if the, the network depends on the state of the nodes, then for me, it's not a network anymore. So you could invent, envision that the network gives you a partial relationship on genes directly, but doesn't include things like presence, absence of small RNA or DNA methylation, uh, or everything we know is involved in gene regulation. Um, okay, I understand. So that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, what I did not, so here, of course, this is uh, way simplified, is that I don't uh, take into account the history uh, of the cells, but which is, which is wrong. So that, of course, um, a cell uh, which, uh, which has already some DNA methylation and uh, some histone modification um, will not react in the same way to the same, um, to the same uh, concentration of uh, transcription factors to the same code words. So that's, that's true. John had a question as well. Yeah, very interesting talk, Julian. You know, I just finished teaching the sort of Alon style uh, picture of, uh, you know, binary gene regulation with uh, repressors and, uh, and, uh, 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 and activators, you know, in the context of uh, bacteria. And, you know, it's kind of unsatisfying because when you look at the actual data, let's go from something complicated like Drosophila down to something simple like E. coli, where the promoter structure is simpler and you have documented DNA binding sites. And many of the transcription factor binding sites at a promoter, you can have multiple inputs for the same transcription factor, some activating, some repressing, some documented to cause activation or repression under different circumstances or for different strains. So I think your picture is fa potentially far better. The problem I see is, so the reason Feynman diagrams became so popular and powerful as a tool in physics was that they were a way to organize calculations that captured enough of the calculation to be useful, but also put things in a pictorial uh, form that, uh, you know, allowed people to see what was going on. What, what's great about the diagram on the right there is that you get an idea of what's going on from it if you have arrows leading from one place to the other. But we all know that the question of integration of those signals is always a, a difficult one. How would you propose to replace the arrow type diagrams with repression and activation with something more general that would incorporate you know this possibility of this uh, complicated map of activation and repression uh and maybe dependence on you know you nicely represented this multi-dimensional transcription factor business but how how are we gonna uh, be able to work with this kind of a picture to really understand what what is going on in i won't say a network but in a collection of interacting biochemicals um uh, thank you for asking this, uh, John. Um, I think we are not ready to answer your question, but what we can do is uh, first look at it. And maybe then we would understand how to represent it in a more convenient form. I just looked at this diagram for one gene, which is well known in one um, context. What I would do next is to look for a single cell uh, RNA-seq data and see whether it helps or not um, to, to, to look at these representations. But, yeah. um, but I agree, it's, you, you, it's not as simple as looking at as a network, but it's not, uh, but the, the problem is that the network uh, is a wrong uh, representation, so. I agree, no, the network, you just have to look at one E. coli promoter and you can see that a network representation is, is not gonna work. Just look on DB Regulon at any promoter and you'll see it's, 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 it's hopeless. So the question is what will replace it and what will be convenient? You know, we, can, we can certainly make like these, uh, you know, real valued multi-dimensional matrices uh, that 
get uh, in code experimentally observed results. But the question is, how can we make something that will replace the network picture that we'll be able to understand and use as a tool? Well, maybe we don't need to make something that is understandable. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, but what, 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 is, what is clear is that we can fed up a, a machine learning algorithm to learn these uh, diagrams from uh, data, and then we can ask questions with that. But do we need to represent it? I'm not sure. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, so only only the computer will understand. So um, next, there is a, a question from uh, Jean-Marc Victor. So I'm just going to read the question. If I understand, one and the same transcription factor can either be active or inactive, depending on the context. Could it be related to chromatin fiber allostery? Um, that's uh, that's a, a very good question. Um, I think it could, yes. Uh, I mean, the chromatin fiber allosteric or any other uh, modification uh, on the, the 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 fiber itself on the nucleosomes. So um, I I don't have a good uh, good examples, but that's a. Uh, that's maybe, uh, maybe how it works, yes. So next, uh, we have a question from Yvon. Uh, Yvon, do you uh, wanna? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Julian, for these interesting uh, ideas. So I was just wondering, um, because, so if I understood well, you are saying that, let's say the Boolean approach of, uh, uh, regulatory network is not sufficient to explain the complexity of some patterns like the stripe formation. But I think there is a literature where uh, people go beyond this simplistic, let's say, uh, Boolean network and they, they use more nonlinear dynamical approaches where you also have some network that, that, that are embedded. And so, and somehow it includes these TF concentration effect by almost by definition. So I was wondering whether you had these in mind or whether you was thinking of a different thing. So the, the, the good thing about uh, <coughs> Boolean is that you can do uh, logic. So basically it uh, escapes the, the, the first uh, drawback of networks that I described that one transcription factor can be only activating or inhibiting because with uh, logic, then you can put uh, or and and so on uh, logical uh, symbols in your uh, in your regulation and then you are not stuck. The problem is that they are binary. Yeah, uh, but I'm not sure it's such a problem actually. Maybe uh, you can end up, you can model pretty well um, the, the regulation during development with uh, binary uh, logic. So I don't know exactly what models you refer to. And uh, well, just like I don't know, Turing, Turing equations or to, to you know Turing patterns formation. I mean, this is a network, a set of coupled nonlinear uh, equations. Uh, so there is a network, and obviously in this case, I mean, it's hard in general to have. Okay, but this I can answer uh, because we tried that actually. Um, yeah. So, so uh, for the, the case of uh, EVE uh, regulation, we tried to uh, build uh, a model which was only based on the network, but uh, a complicated one, uh, including reaction, diffusion, and all the ingredients that you can have in an embryo. Um, and actually we could not manage to make the, the, seven, uh, the seven stripes as they are whatever uh, uh, parameters and uh, uh, we were taking. I mean, for a simple enough model, of course. Okay, uh, I thought, yeah, okay, fine. So we really uh, need um, to have a contextualized, I mean, okay, when we say nonlinearity, now I understand what you mean. So that, of course, if you take cross terms, um, uh, but, of course, you can end up with uh, fitting with the, the 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 pattern, but then you have uh, so many uh, so many variables and so less observables that I, I don't think you're making you're improving anything. Yeah. 
Okay, so so your point is okay. How to keep the uh, reduction of dimensionality, let's say, with the Boolean networks, uh, but with uh, and explaining the, most of the data, which is yeah, a very complex. Okay, I, I just have also a question, and uh, uh, also for the first part. So I like your gene domain definition, uh, and uh, and it, so. In your definition at the end, it means that let's say TAD is like a side effect somehow. I mean, these are not really the important uh, aspects. We don't need to understand really the, the contact properties. What we need to understand is, or what we need to, to define, these are 1D uh, um, aspects so, somehow. Is that, I mean, I, I, I exaggerate, of course, but uh, yes, yes, can you, you exaggerate. But there, yes, um, there is something which is really nice about um, making the high C experiments to get these domains, is that um, otherwise we would not really know where are the answer where to look for. Mm. So okay. uh, I think they are a very nice way to address uh, genome-wide mm. the boundaries of the gene domain and to okay. try to understand the logic afterwards, it's, it's very valuable. Okay, thank you. Um, Vera has a question as well. Vera, do you want to ask it live? Okay, sure. Hello. Um, so this is very interesting and provocative. Um, I'm just curious, I'm a bit lost, of course, but um, I'm just curious as to what you call the context, because um, I, I guess there are quite a lot of things that we could associate to context, uh, including the uh, epigenomic modifications in the area, the 3D interactions with distant regions that are outside this gene domain. Would you call an interaction with something that is really, really far part of the gene domain? And could that explain also in a way that the TF could have different um, uh, properties activating or repressing if it basically, let's say, recruits Pol2 or not? Because in the end, uh, you know, transcription factors, I, I don't really know what an official modern definition of a TF is. So do you think it's a factor that is supposed to um, facilitate transcription by recruiting Pol2? Because I guess the ultimate answer as to whether the gene is activated or not is uh, if Pol2 starts transcribing or not, or am I wrong? Uh, yes. So, so basically it's not just the TF that will determine if uh, transcription is active or not, but the context includes the presence or absence of Pol2, the presence or absence of other repressive marks, right? Yes. So, uh, of course, uh, later on in development, this uh, the, 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 the question is much more complex, and this was also uh, outlined by uh, another uh, question about DNA methylation and, uh, and uh, epigenetic modification. So this very simple kill uh, falls apart, and that's why uh, I took this uh, example because here, what is uh, really amazing is that you have um, cellular, um, you, you have nuclei which can be uh, very uh, close by, but still they, they will or won't express uh, the, the, the gene Eve. And this is not depending on uh, modifications because at the initial stage here, all the, the nuclei are, are the same. So I would say that the, the I agree that the, the very simple scheme that I presented in the beginning is uh, more related to early development than later on. Some other players come in the, into play, and I agree that uh, chromatin compartments, uh, methylation, uh, long-range inter uh, interaction that may uh, be uh, uh, further than the TAD you are you you're, you're in uh, may enter into the picture and RNAs and a uh, lot of things. Um, so that's why I took this uh, simple example. I don't want uh, really to overstate uh, and say that this is valid for uh, for all gene regulation that happens during development and disease. Uh, 